Hey, hello. My name is Chris, and as you can see, I'm from L2Bit. If you don't know L2Bit, we are this website that compares different Ethereum scaling solutions. And we've been researching multi-chain assets recently a lot, uh, as we are working on something coming soon. And one thing I can tell you about multi-chain assets is that we have much more questions than answers. That's why I'm super excited for this upcoming panel. And let me introduce to the stage um, our great panelists. Irene from Layer Zero. Daniel from Ovix. Jordi from Mantle. And Seraphim from Lido. Let me just distribute the microphones. <clears throat> yeah, That's and nice. let's start with a, a short round of introductions. And by the way, I will be looking at my phone, but I have notes here. I'm not tweeting at the same time. Uh, let's do a quick round of introductions. Uh, please give, give us a little background about yourself and the project you're representing. Irene. For sure. Hi, thank you guys so much for having me here today. My name is Irene. I am head of strategy at Layer Zero Labs. Layer Zero Labs is the creator of both Layer Zero, the protocol, and Stargate. Layer Zero is an omni-chain interoperability protocol, and Stargate is uh, the leading native asset bridge. Thank you very much. Seraphim. Hey, I'm Seraphim from Lido. Uh, I call myself DeFi expansionist. It means nothing, really. Uh, <laughs> and Lido is a liquid staking uh, protocol, basically. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Daniel. I, I'm, uh, I, I run a research team uh, for a lending market on uh, uh, Polygon POS and Polygon ZKVM. Thank you very much. Jordi. Hey, so uh, I'm a strategic advisor to Mantle. So L2, L2 Beats. So Mantle is going to be a new L2. Uh, it's in testnet. We have an announcement very soon. Um, and I'm advising on all kind of strategy matters and ecosystem uh, matters. And we're really excited with what, what's going to get launched. It's a DAO backed. Um, layer two, which is quite new. It's out of BitDAO, which was you know a very large uh, DAO. It's been converted to Mantle. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to keep it not just like me interviewing each of them, but, but rather uh, as a discussion in which we can learn different perspectives from uh, each of them. So let's start with you know understanding what's going on in DeFi is definitely not an easy task. And for example, stable coins seem to be pretty simple concept at first. But then, like especially last year, you realize that uh, fiat-based stable coins, collateralized stable coins, and algo stable coins. And last year, we realized these are not the same. And that's even before we get into the details. So today, with the multi-chain world we're in, it's even more complicated because we have all all those different types of the same asset. We have native assets, we have bridged tokens, we have omni-chain tokens. Can you shed some light on how all of these work together from the perspective of your projects? And I will start with Jody. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we have a lot of kinds of stable coins and um, it was touched a little bit in the last discussion, but they're all different use cases. And my opinion is that we will have specific ones designed for different use cases. I think, um, you know, the initial kind of stable coin that we had that found, found product market fit was basically a checking account. You know, you have these coins that a bank is holding for you and you have them there, you can transact with them, but you don't get any yield. So that's kind of like something that was missing with USDC, USDT. And then you're hoping that the bank, you know, doesn't go broke and, and everything works out. Um, then you have something like Luna, which, you know, was, was an exciting part of last year where it's sort of, algorithmically has this loophole. Uh, we can get into that if we want to. Um, and then the third category of something like DAI, you know, uh, algorithmic, but backed by a volatile asset. That also has problems, as we saw in, in multiple points. So I think now the next generation is going to be first going from checking account to savings account. So that's kind of where the multi-chain uh, world comes in one way, which is for a checking account to become a savings account, it doesn't really have to be about transactions. You can just have your money in your savings account getting yield, 
and you don't necessarily have to like move it to your friends. It's not what's gonna be used for, for Venmo, for example. So those assets can exist on multiple chains, and because they don't necessarily need to move around all the, all the time, you can have different ways of getting yield. So either you know something like um, staking uh, ETH and getting, getting using that yield to get a stablecoin out of it. You can uh, you know use something like CRV USD, where it's getting yield from transactions. There's many ways to get yield, um, hopefully sustainable ways, but those don't need to move around. So I think for uh, that category, it's kind of okay. And then you know bridges and and things like messaging protocols are needed for the second category, which is uh, the fungibility type of stable coins, and, and those ones, you do want to move them around, you want to transact and do different things with them. So uh, that's, that's where everything else comes in the multi-chain world. Yeah, and like, what are the differences between those different assets? Because like, I, like, I would assume that WEF is exactly the same as EF, like, or at least very similar, but is WBTC exactly the same as BTC? No, the answer is flat out no. Um, and to kind of tie into his uh, his answer, uh, it's not just the stable coins are uh, fit different purposes. Uh, we had like great definitions of stable coins, by the way. Today, I think that my favorite one was was posted earlier. Uh, uh, give me token, I give you USD, or give me USD, I give you token. Great summary. Uh, it was just missing the algos, which you brought up with Luna. Uh, um, for, I will add that on top of satisfying different use cases, from um, like from a lending partner standpoint, um, uh, they also highlight different um, uh, like risks. Uh, different risk profiles. Uh, obviously, uh, bridge tokens carry bridge risk. In the case of Wrap BTC on on a Polygon chain, for example, you carry you carry like a like a double risk, right? You have you have both the 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 bridge the bridging risk for example, to Polygon POS. Plus, on top of that, you have uh, you have the counterparty risk with uh, um, uh, with Bitco. That's that that that's the counterparty that 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 holds the actual Bitcoin in. I might add a U.S. jurisdiction. So you have. The, the well, part of the part of the counterparty risk is the jurisdictional risk, and now to loop it back to, to, to stable coins, the one thing, the other thing is, um, you have different different kind of risks also in terms of like where different kind of counterparty risks, right? Uh, so we've talked about the USDC DPEG today. Uh, USDT is no stranger uh, to DPEGs. I like to think Paul Arduino is the the one person in crypto that has had to deal with the, the largest cumulative amount of FUD uh, over the course of his career um, in all of crypto. Someone correct me. I, I stand to be corrected, but I, I don't think he can be beaten. Um, uh, and but we see that like the FUD between USDT and USDC can go both ways. It doesn't just go to you. Just towards USDT because USDC lives in the United States. USDT does does not, at least until now. It is it, it is unclear how what is the extent the, the extent of the reach of the U.S. government to USDT's um, uh, actual dollar reserves, uh, dollar back reserves. Assuming that you believe that they are fully backed, I don't want to get into that. So yeah, there's like a lot of different uh, risk profiles that have to be uh, taken into account uh, when 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 onboarding these tokens and in, into in, in, in DeFi for for actual use. You call out a really good point around bridge risk and bridge tokens, and I think a lot of times people don't realize when they're using certain bridges that they're locking their value in a smart contract and getting an IOU on the other side or a synthetic asset that says, uh, you know, when you want to come back across, you're trusting the smart contract to protect all of those assets. And uh, when we at Layer Zero were thinking about how we were going to construct the protocol, we were ultimately thinking about the use case with stable coins, and that's what inspired a lot of our design principles. Uh, and we thought to ourselves, the risk should not be perpetual in the hands of, of users. It should feel like interacting with Uniswap in a way. And uh, when you make your transfer between chains, you shouldn't always carry with yourself that uh, like s potential breach of, of security. And then I think like native versus omnichain, because you're asking about these three differences. With Circle, they natively issue on particular chains. And uh, nearly every ecosystem we speak with that doesn't have natively issued USDC is like begging Circle in their DMs every single day, wanting that, but frankly speaking, issuers like Circle move very slowly. So then you end up having wrappers. Actually today, Go, Aave Stablecoin is launching, and they're launching on ETH mainnet, uh, and one of the strategies they, or conversations they need to have internally to figure out is how do we disincentivize wrappers? Because once you have wrapped versions of your stablecoin, you as the stablecoin issuer don't have any control over it. There could be some sort of hack, and it affects your brand, and you know, users are harmed and downstream effects like what we're seeing with Phantom, and we'll talk about that later with, with multi-chain and, and the hack there, will occur. And then omni-chain is, is this new uh, 
primitive. And you know, at layer zero, we created something called uh, the Omnichain Fungible Token. And it's a way to launch or convert ERC-20s into ones that are native on multiple chain chains and transfer seamlessly just by paying gas. There are no pools of liquidity. It's uh, you know, simply managing state between all of the, the contracts that are deployed on, on different chains. So you know, we can dive into that a little bit more, but I think understanding the difference between native, bridged, and omnichain is really important if you're building a DeFi protocol, but also if you're managing an entire ecosystem like Mantle. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll tackle security later on, definitely. Serafim, is there anything you would like to add to this? Yeah, I guess every chain wants staked ETH. That's the case now. Um, probably the biggest use case of DeFi now is just looping staked ETH yield. So every single layer two, every single layer one needs staked ETH. And how to get there is a bridging question, obviously. And um, there, may, there may or may not be something like a CCTP uh, for stake T for the next coming months. I'm hoping that's going to be brought out uh, before the end of the year. And that way we can kind of go to BNB, go to uh, Mantle much quicker, you know. Um, because, yeah, if you look at stake T on layer twos, it's absolutely exploding, and that can be multiplied by going to Mantle, ZKVM, Scroll, BNB, et cetera. So uh, bridging is a big conversation at Lido at the moment. Yep. Yeah. The fact that, that we have all those bridged assets on every chain, because as you mentioned, like every chain wants these assets, and every chain wants this they, their own version of the, the of, of this asset. But from the user perspective, like what are the challenges that the users are facing with all those different bridged assets, all those different versions of this asset? Well, for stake teeth specifically, and I guess that applies to everything, there should be one version of stake teeth everywhere. Otherwise, it's a pain in the ass. Like, it happened before with other assets, and you had to, like, do a bunch of stuff, you know, to manage it. Basically, ideally, Lido DAO owns the keys to all that, uh, to, you know, stake teeth across the crypto ecosystem. Bridge should be upgradable, and it should be one version of wrap stake teeth or stake teeth across the board. So no fragmentation is uh, ideal. Yeah, I was going to say, you had mentioned that ecosystems want their own versions, and I would argue that ecosystems all want the canonical version. Um, well, with regards to fragmentation, that's more risks uh, from, from a lending market perspective, because uh, obviously uh, the, the, the main premise for, for a functional lending market is liquidations, and uh, for liquidations to be as healthy as possible, you need ideally to have as, as little slippage as possible to swap in and out of, um, out of, out of tokens. Uh, so fragmentation is, is definitely a problem uh, from that perspective. Um, however, when it comes to the stable coins, since there are so many stable coins, it also comes with some pros. Uh, the, the risks that we've mentioned until now can also be spun around on their head. Um, if you are short the dollar versus crypto, uh, uh, Michael said, had this as a closing thought before, uh, as an answer to a question, uh, it's, it's actually in your interest to borrow as many different stable coins as possible uh, to, to have the lottery, like you have a free lottery ticket on, on, on any given one of them be pegging at any given point, right? And you have effectively no downside to this thing unless you, there's some reason to believe that any of these stable coins will I don't know, skyrocket and like depeg upwards, which is, I would say, the, the more unlikely of the, of, of the two scenarios for, for a depeg. Um, and, and so you can actually benefit from, from, these, from, from these kind of risks, depending on what your, what, your, what your user case profile is. Anybody wants to add something to this? Like, from the user perspective, like, how, 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 the, do, how are people supposed to manage all those different types of assets? I think, like I said, it's more like looking at the user's intention and not like, okay, there's 50 stable coins, what do I do? It's more, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to just sa save your money somewhere and earn a yield? Are you trying to like, you know, have it so you can transact? Are you trying to use it as collateral for something else? Are you just trying to farm, you know, degen farm? Each one of those has different um, designs that make sense, and some of them need more fungibility, some of them... Liquidity doesn't really matter because you're just kind of getting yield on something. And I think we're seeing interesting things now, like something like Pendle I like because it starts to break up things into like the, the constituent parts. And you can, you know, you can break out the yield component and it'll be a separate token and it'll be like underlying can be a separate token. Something I'm personally interested in that we're uh, working with an app that will deploy in Mantle is actually avoiding all the liquidations. So when you have something like DAI, you know, ETH goes down, they have to start liquidating ETH, and you know, this is a whole mess, and sometimes it gets systemic, as we saw a couple years ago. So uh, another idea, another completely different design that hasn't 
been seen much apart from Blend a little bit is having non-liquidation um, loans where you can create stable coins out of a volatile asset. So that sounds strange. Like, how can you get non-liquidation, you know, die type of asset from Ethereum? If Ethereum goes down, then like, what's going to happen? Who's going to take the loss? So the idea is sort of like Pendle, you break these things out into two different things. So one can be a put option that somebody backstops and you know, puts a price on it. Maybe they want 5% yield to, you know, let's say uh, Ethereum is at $2,000. You can issue stable coins up to $1,000 and you get a separate institution that kind of uh, at a discount buys the one token at let's say 95%. So they're, they're earning 5% to say, if Ethereum goes below 1,000, we will backstop it so there's no loss, there's no liquidation needed. And you start creating these dynamics that are a lot safer. You're not having like, you know, uh, Oracle manipulation risk, you're not having these other risks. So we're kind of looking forward to innovating and creating more like safe user experience because users don't want to go to sleep and then worry that, you know, they're going to wake up and the thing will have wicked down and like liquidated their, their asset. So um, I think there'll be more development in that space. I love the Pendle team also, and, and they converted their Pendle token to an OFT, actually, using layer zero. But I, I think when you're talking about user issues, you also want to reduce the number of clicks as, as possible. Like, we don't often talk about churn in, in DeFi and building these user experiences, but if you're trying to execute a DeFi strategy across five different chains, and now we're in a world where there are, like, t so many L2s, and uh, users want to move their tokens between them quickly and they're willing to pay for that convenience uh, by pricing their risk differently, uh, you have to design those, those user flows to be friendlier. And I think that's, that's a huge issue. And so if you're going through wrapped asset bridges or have to go to centralized exchanges and, and exchange there, uh, it's just way more likely that you'll end up churning from whatever you were intending to do in the first place. Yeah, I saw it a lot. Like me using many different, many different, you know, chains. Uh, I often get caught in like I want to do something, but oh, I have it on that chain, <laughs> and now I have to bridge. So now I have to wait for like I don't know, fifteen minutes, let's say. And yeah, like how can we, how can we, you know, help it? How can we fix that? Well, I can speak to how Stargate was designed, for example, and and right now it's. Uh, on DeFi Llama, for example, the most uh, widely used bridge per 24 hours of, of transactions. And interestingly, the most popular pathways are Arbitrum to Optimism, back and forth. And so the L2 to L2 bridging experience, uh, I think what we've seen uh, proven is that users want that to be quick. And so they're using a bridge like Stargate more than they use native bridges. Uh, and um, how Stargate works is unified pools of liquidity. It's only native assets and OFTs. So for OFTs, there doesn't need to be pools of liquidity. It's just, like I said, gas, transfer. It's a message that gets sent, and the state is managed between all of them. Uh, but otherwise, it, we use the, the Delta algorithm, which is like an accounting and balancing algorithm across uh, the, the different native assets on, on the, I think it's eight chains that, that we're live on right now. So that's one way that we're trying to solve for this. Yeah, I guess ideal scenario is that they don't even have to think about bridging. If they live on Arbitrum, there's a ample DEX liquidity to buy from. Uh, theoretical scenario, you can mint stake teeth on that chain. Uh, so hopefully they're not even supposed to think about that stuff. We just have to create ecosystems in every layer too. Um, one ideal scenario maybe for bridging would be that uh, people from other chains find a way to migrate to Ethereum. Like there's a huge BNB ecosystem, obviously, that I like a lot. And it would be kind of cool if they learn to actually move their funds to Ethereum, play around there. That's just my, but, but, but that's just my view, really. The reality is they shouldn't think about bridging much. They should be just developed ecosystems to tap into. I do hope that in like a, a year or less, there are applications that have abstracted away, like all the clicks that are involved in, in bridging and, and the, the latency there. And uh, we're, we're seeing some of those. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw like the Kane's announcement for the like the, the new synthetics uh, decks that he's doing, and you know some of the things that we're going to be seeing are going to be maybe more CFI onto DeFi, at least experience-wise, and maybe you know you, not your keys, not your coin. Maybe that, you know that's a great phrase for you know hardcore Bitcoiners trying to uh, maintain their wealth, but for just a, an app experience, maybe it is going to be a little more centralized on the experience. Maybe your your keys get held. In your browser or somewhere else, like you know, we kind of find find a safe way to do those things. Um, and I think with bridging as well, you know, obviously, FTX went down. A lot of people are using FTX to bridge onto um, Solana, right? So that going away, we're seeing 
Solana TVL kind of struggle a little bit, like how is money safely get onto Solana at this point? Um, so looking at a multi-chain world, you know, maybe there will be some centralized players that have to play some part in, in getting people from fiat onboarded into like the, the broader ecosystem and, and kind of bridging everything. Um, obviously, you know, Mantle is uh, closely partnered with Bybit, so there's, there's some uh, benefit for potentially doing some bridging from fiat uh, through there. Um, you know, other exchanges participate to a certain extent. Uh, I mean, you know, with L2s, they're all trying to get as many, you know, you want Binance, you want like all the different options as well. Um, ultimately, we just want users to have a good experience. And to your point, you know, it might take 15 minutes to get from bridge to bridge. Like, if blockchains are cities, it, it does take some time to travel between the cities. And, you know, for the L2s, they want to create a good city. So people want to stay there. They want it to be safe. You know, you don't want like a Chicago kind of city where people are getting rugged all the time. You want, you want a safe city. And hopefully people stay there and the ecosystem grows and there's enough liquidity to do, you know, more um, activity. Um, I'd like to add this also that uh, I mean, with, with all the, the, the developments happening in the, the, the zero knowledge world and even on Bitcoin with discrete log contracts on the Lightning Network, um, we might not get to a point where we can have atomic transactions between all sorts of tokens on their on their various native chains, uh, but we can we can get to like hacky in between solutions that then that, that then iterate over uh, over time, um, whereby you could you could you could get Bitcoiners to effectively. Um, uh, access a perpetuals protocol on on, on, an, e, on an EVM chain uh, b with a discrete log contract because as long as as long as the Bitcoiner agrees to who's going to be uh, the the like the the oracle for the specific value transfer on their uh, on their Bitcoin channel like which can be anything it can literally be anything um, uh, you can you can get Bitcoiners to play around on on EVM chains because like like from like from from the Bitcoin standpoint the Bitcoin ecosystem standpoint they, they like the the push there is to figure out how to build DeFi on top of Bitcoin, which is ex which is way harder to do than it is on on an EVM chains for uh, obvious uh, obvious like smart contract language reasons. Um, but um, there's a lot of capital that is tied up in the Bitcoin ecosystem, and um, uh, figuring out how to get access to this capital in in while still satisfying as much as possible uh, the not your keys, not your coins uh, um, ethos. Uh, I think there's a lot of headway that can still be done uh, in 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 that. I love that, and we'll actually dissect both. Like, first, let's uh, let's get to what, what Jordi said. Like, you, you mentioned that yeah, sometimes it just has to take fifteen minutes because it is what it is. And I like this approach because I think that uh, you know, while trying to figure out how to fix all those issues, like usability is very, of course, very important aspect, but. If what, what's even more important from, from my perspective and what is a huge focus for l 2 is security and risk profiles you know, associated with, with all those different cross-chain techniques. And you know, securing smart contracts is tough in itself and multi-chain brings another set of challenges. And you know, we can't not mention uh, recent events with multi-chain hack and what happened to phantom liquidity due to that, and this reminds us that all those assets like are not, like all those bridged or you know, cross-chain assets are not necessarily exactly the same that the native assets that they represent. So wh what is your take on this? Like how, do we, how, should we, how should we approach security and securing and informing users about different risk aspects of all these multi-chain you know, tokens? It seems like the CEO should not own the whole bridge. That's my <laughs> takeaway. Well, let's start with that. <laughs> I mean, this is a big problem, right? Because like, you've got other bridge, bridging solutions, and which, this is a Chinese situation, but this could also happen in the States, right? Like if some big bridging provider completely based in the States, SEC or FBI knocks on the door and like, oh, yeah, shut it down. Like, what are we going to do now, right? So um, that's something that's not just related to Chinese um, politics and well no because what you're describing is a service right like it, it's dependent on the creator company to maintain the integrity of it and so if the creator company you know gets into a horrible accident or is arrested 
then uh, if you've integrated this or your stack is based off that bridge, you're screwed. Uh, it's the difference between a protocol and a service. Like a protocol should be a, an immutable primitive that exists forever. Anyone can uh, compose it, integrate it into their protocol, and regardless of the liveness of, of the creator company can continue using it. And so like that in itself I think is a really important design principle for cross-chain messaging and bridges. Uh, and, and you know, in the case of Phantom, they treated multi-chain assets as canonical, uh, even without a prefix, which I think was also quite harmful for user awareness and like consumer safety, uh, because ultimately those are wrapped assets, uh, and, and now they're like horribly depegged, and users are have no idea what to do with with those assets. Actually, same applies to oracles. When you look at top three oracles in this space, what are the chances that one of these oracles get prices from like? people from the same building, you know, like, we all know there's a bunch of these kind of solutions out there in, in the top five, right? So theoretically, someone walks, it walks in, a regulator says, shut down the oracles, what now? We've got no bridging, we've got nothing, you know, we're fucked, so. Yeah, at one point you had mentioned uh, bridges and wanting them to be upgradable, and I think like a slight pushback, I think that it's so important that uh, cross-chain messaging protocols and then one layer below, uh, above those are actually comprised only of immutable smart contracts. Like only with immutability can you uh, be assured of forever permissionlessness and also perhaps censorship resistance. Uh, if you wouldn't accept an upgrade to your ledger or to your Trezor, for example, which would be like such a strange and disarming thing, uh, why would you accept the same for your, your DeFi protocol? And for a lot of these bridges, they're made of upgradable contracts. And even if it's a benign upgrade, something that's meant to improve the protocol, oftentimes there are bugs in those those upgrades. In fact, nearly every single hack from 2022 is caused by smart contract upgrades, not its inherent architectural flaws. And so uh, I think it, when you're you know selecting your bridges or designing them, thinking about immutability and whether the technology itself was built to withstand regulatory uh, crackdowns, for example. Like, if your technology is built in a way that can make it perverted to whatever political environment we're in, it will be changed to, to you know, censor messages, for example. But if you've built your technology so that's immutable and it, it cannot comply with a different regulatory environment, then it, it won't be. And, and that's something that was really important to us when we were designing our protocol. Uh, so I have a, like I, have, I have a, want to push back a little bit on this. I agree. I, I agree with mo the majority of things you said. But what if what if the upgrade um, is an upgrade that reduces uh, the the rule set of the protocol uh, and is only opt in? I think opt in is is a really important piece. So for example, how we designed the layer zero protocol so that it was comprised entirely of immutable contracts, but could evolve with research, was that uh, we created it so. The off-chain infrastructure is, is always open and permissionless. Anyone can run those components, uh, but the endpoints, which are the smart contract libraries we deploy to each of those chains, are fully immutable. But we could deploy new endpoints that applications can point their contracts towards. So that means you know, five or 10 years from now, maybe there's a different validation technique that is trusted by our, our entire industry. Maybe there's a smart contract library that leverages uh, optimistic rollups or, or ZK, and applications can take their time to vet how long the security has been uh, like how long it has secured the, the value for and you know even read the, the code themselves and then opt in and we actually debated this quite a lot at the beginning of the year I won't repeat it right now but I want to ask you like in this all multi-chain world is it like that if we have those interconnected interconnected assets that are represented on all those different chains isn't it that they you know the the uh, the, the lowest security chain of, of those is this weak spot that, you know, compromises all of them? For bridges that are designed in like a hub and smoke model, that, that's certainly true, or bridges that are sort of like ultimately middle chain. I'd be curious to hear your guys' thoughts as well. She's the bridging expert, all right? I'm just... I mean, I'll I'm say just, just like in general, you know, users want a stable coin to be a stable coin. They don't want to like deal with any kind of risks, like whether it's bridging risk, whether it's DPEG risk, any, any of these risks. So it's up to builders and like the providers to really start abstracting all of them. When I say all of them, I mean all of them. So like I said, like there is a way to get insurance on certain things, right? Like uh, even Luna had like some <laughs> insurance on a UST DPEG. Um, there's a way to get bridge insurances. At some point, we just need to get these things to a scale where it's cheap enough so that third parties can potentially like um, backstop certain risks that exist and create the user experience in a very 
you know, dumb way or like something like Anchor could thrive because all people needed to do was just, you know, click, click, and that was it. Um, of course, that, you know, uh, didn't, didn't actually stay stable. It stayed stable at, at zero in the end. So um, when it comes to like bridging risk and things like that, I really think that we can't, that the future is not going to be like the last few years where like, we have these massive hacks, mm -hmm. 500 million, like this can't happen in the future. That's existential if that is the future. And I would say like even more important than insurance is uh, if you're a stablecoin issuer, you should own part of your security layer. Uh, certainly not unilateral control, but uh, should be able to, uh, just like, you know, how we talk about uh, actually like owning, custodying your own funds, uh, you shouldn't be relying on a service, like I had said before, to, to manage the movement between chains for your stablecoin. But one thing is that like the, the, the bridging, but the other is like the origin, the, the origin of the of the asset. Like for example, if I have things that are bridged somewhere but they are based on Ethereum, I rely that okay, even if the bridge uh, does something weird, then still Ethereum secures my like the origin of these assets. But what happens if the origin is somewhere like what is what happens if the origin is some chain that I can't really rely on, that is controlled by like three out of five multisig? And what, what how should I tweet treat you know, assets bridged from this chain? Um, fuck around and find out. <laughs> Literally the same <laughs> thought. What? Literally the same thought. <laughs> fuck around, find out, like, get wrecked. It's, it's, it's crypto. It's like, it's, I mean, if you believe, if you believe in, in, in like, I don't know, the open market capitalism of crypto that, come, that is born out of you know, the modularity and the, and the permissionlessness of crypto, that this is part and parcel. It's like people, the one argument is that um, uh, people getting, getting, getting rugged, getting wrecked, getting screwed is, 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 is part of, comes part and parcel with how we, we evolve as an ecosystem. Like someone has to take a hit for us to core, like for the information to coordinate around what the best practices are. If nobody got wrecked, we wouldn't really, we would either have to be immaculate at conception, which we aren't, uh, or, or well, we're, 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 we're not really serious. Let's be honest, we enjoy getting wrecked. We love it. Yeah, two, two, sure, two, two, two wrecked people on stage there. Oh, we love it, you know? <laughs> We've actually, I, I will say, I, I've seen a few protocols go through a really painful transition, it, it, having made that exact mistake. Um, and, uh, you know, like we're talking about stable coins here today, but for example, there are so many games that invested maybe $100 million to build their game in the Terra Luna ecosystem. And then after the whole collapse, like, their, their project is stranded, or their NFT collection, that whole community is stranded. Uh, and you know, the way that we've tried to help them move off was actually the inception of our OFT and ONFT standards. Like, you should not have to uh, like silo your project or make your project dependent on the success of a particular chain. Like, sure, Polygon or, or Avalanche or any of these chains are, are very trusted today, and, and you know, we love working with all those, those ecosystems and foundations, but this is a, a very rapidly evolving ecosystem, so your assets shouldn't be tied to a particular ecosystem. If, if I can add a point here, this is where um, like DAP chains and supernets and, and all, all those things come into play, right? Because then if you run your own DAP chain, you also have the freedom to potentially commit the state of your DAP chain to whatever blockchain you care for. It could even be multiple blockchains. So if one blockchain goes down, you could in theory, you know, like, trustlessly reboot from another on another with the state on another blockchain you know or just not be affected by the main but by any given blockchain that you're tied into yeah you still have the problem with the bridged assets though you know <laughs> that, that still exists <laughs> thank you very much so we've covered usability we covered security and now let's talk about a bit uh, about capital efficiency because like spreading a token across different chains through different bridges makes each individual liquidity quite low and on the other hand, concentrating liquidity in one place, like to make it hard for newer chains to attract builders. Like everybody wants to build on Ethereum, because the liquidity is on Ethereum. And how to how to address this? Like especially, I'm I'm curious um, for Jody. Like how do we address the the fact that that we have to somehow attract this liquidity? That we have to what? Attract the liquidity. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, each ecosystem is is all thinking about liquidity. I mean. Uh, you know, for Mantle, it's a little bit easier because there's a, a DAO that has, you know, billions of dollars of uh, assets under its treasury that the DAO manages. And so a lot of that will kind of naturally go to, uh, to the Mantle ecosystem. Um, I think, you know, Arbitrum was in a good spot where they kind of got a flywheel of activity and they managed to have people bring uh, liquidity there. Um, 
Yeah, I think ultimately, like there, there can't be infinite versions of each thing. There does have to be like some liquidity constraint. Obviously, with Lido, we're seeing that people generally prefer to um, kind of congregate to something that is very easy to transact with in, in different places. Um, but you know, there is space to uh, ha make more illiquid assets and stable coins. Like I said, if if the point of it is yield. Um, then it doesn't really matter so much. You can just hold it. There's no capital efficiency in that point because it's just one to one. You're just holding it and, and earning yield. Um, capital efficiency, otherwise, you know, with DeFi, we like composability. We like using it as collateral on DEXs. Um, there's some cool DEXs out there that are already doing like the FTX model of cross collateral, and those are going to become more and more popular, I think. So, you know, you can just put your stake ETH and trade derivatives, and it'll use that as the collateral. That's very capital efficient, for example. Um, so I think those things will kind of like naturally evolve. Yeah, I think capital efficiency is interesting in terms of LIDO because uh, last six months, out of nowhere, we have a bunch of these uh, liquidity forks backed by stake teeth and RE, CB, et cetera. And I think that's kind of cool. It's just that, yeah, uh, some of them can scale a lot, but I don't think they can scale massively just because, yeah, it's not capital efficient. We're going to see the same situation as with decentralized stable coins, most of them at least. Um, but whoever figures out how to, you know, be backed by OSTs, that is, earn yield, and at the same time have a one-to-one -one backing as a stable coin would be, well, that would be amazing, right? That could actually not compete with Tether per se to start with, but get as close as it gets to that, you know? So, uh, yeah. To your point about driving liquidity to new ecosystems, I mean, having spoken with the Polygon Supernets team, with the Avalanche Subnets team, OP Labs with, with the super chain and even like Arbitrum Orbit now, by the end of year, we're going to have like 50 new chains that have, you know, thriving or, or, or trying to have thriving ecosystems. And so we, we simply cannot assume that there will be significant pools of liquidity that are independent on each of those. And so uh, I think this is actually where omnichain tokens come in. Like it's incredibly important that tokens can just transfer seamlessly between all of them without needing pools of liquidity. Uh, and BTCB is an interesting example of this. Ava Labs issued uh, a version of, of wrapped Bitcoin via their, their C chain and then converted it to an OFT. And, and since the conversion, the token supply has doubled. And new ecosystems like uh, Cordao, for example, I asked uh, or asking the team for BTCB. And you know they just deploy an OFT contract there. And, and now they can move seamlessly between all of them. Uh, and the like deposit volume of BTCB has also doubled since then in, in protocols like like Aave and the velocity of usage has, has gone up as well. So again, we just cannot rely on independent pools of liquidity if by end of year we're gonna have 50 new like bases, Zora chain, all of these others. And will USDC be you know deployed natively in all of them? I think highly unlikely. Uh, we have CCTP now, which is the attestation service with Circle launched, and bridges and messaging protocols can plug into it. But uh, I think by end of year, it'll only be on maybe three three chains, and that's that's really exciting. Uh, but for every single one of these these new app chains, like supernets and subnets, don't have native assets there uh, unless omnichain tokens are deployed there. Uh, so you know, for for a game, like I said, or uh, a DeFi protocol and an app chain, they need to have some form of native stablecoin as well. Maybe Tether will. No, actually, they, they started prioritizing DeFi finally. So uh, we might see some Tether CCTP coming out by the end of the year, maybe. Uh, I have a question for the bridge expert. Uh, what about um, uh, light client bridges? Sorry? What about light client bridges? As in, how can they fit into all of this? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Elaborate a little bit more. Do you just mean like why would a would a project want to use a light client bridge or yeah yeah? I from my conversations with all of these teams that are launching their own app chains, they they are actually more interested in having like native versions of their tokens there, and so the, the omni chain token model makes a lot more sense for them. Like take Mantle for example. There's a, a stablecoin team that we're speaking with and. Uh, they know that we'll be live on day one for base and, and linea and uh, you know unannounced but likely mantle like we're a huge fan of of, of their team and, and project and so as soon as as we're there they simply just deploy OFT contracts there as well hook them up with the set trusted remotes and now they truly have these native stablecoins there and as we talked about or as Seraphim said 
users eventually shouldn't have to go through a bridge. And in fact, with Omnichain tokens, you don't have to go through a bridge. Uh, protocols can, can build in a user flow where it's simply just one click and it's a transfer. We are running out of time soon, so uh, there is one more thing that I would like to discuss because there was something that actually we tackled a lot recently, and how do we measure all those things, all this liquidity in those cross-chain cross -chain environments? So, like, imagine if I have a token on chain A, and I transfer it to chain B, and then I move it to chain C, and then back again to chain A, uh, and assume that I'm using different, you know, different uh, methods of uh, transferring these tokens through all those chains. Like, what is the liquidity of this token on each of those uh, chains? So my, my naive answer would be assets minus liabilities. Uh, whenever you do all these things, there's there's liabilities going all around the all around the books. Uh, take the source assets, subtract all the liabilities, and that's the true value of the token. So, but if I if I have a let's say USDC bridged from bridged not natively like minted on another chain, if I bridge it, does it mean that uh, there is like it's an IOU. Like, should I should I count this uh, this asset on the second bridge uh, on the second chain as well? And how? I, I, if it goes through a wrapped asset bridge and it's an IOU. It's it's not like one to one. Uh, and I, I think w with some DeFi protocols, it, it's hard to uh, like with lending and borrowing protocols. It's it's hard to accurately represent the fact that like wrapped asset versions of a token aren't actually worth the same value. As, as the real deal. But I think tactically, I, I'm not sure if you're asking this in particular, if you have an omnichain token, it's moving across all of these different chains without needing pools of liquidity, how you would calculate the total supply is just the ag aggregate circulating supply. Yeah. And how we actually, you know, we, we don't discuss TVL metric <laughs> uh, as much as, uh, as we should probably. We rely on it all the time. But, you know, right now, if, if I have USDC in, are, you know, in Ethereum, and I bridge it to, to Optimism. Actually, right now it's counted twice usually, and if I if I bridge it from Optimism to some other chain, usually it's counted for the third time because like it's counted as a locked uh, locked token in Optimism and then minted on the second chain. Like, have you seen any approaches to actually try to figure it out? Well, on the practical level, I would only care about DEX liquidity, I think. Like the actual TVO available for transactions and the rest is like, don't think matters as much, to be fair. Um, so yeah, I think the solution is just a June dashboard with all the layer twos and see what the DEX liquidity is in. Um, and uh, yeah, Bob's your uncle, yeah. I mean, TVL is this like weird metric. There should always be a star because, you know, not just because like Alameda, we know we'd put like a billion dollars and then take it out and then put in the next one and you know, like on Solana, like the, the same one developer would just make 10 protocols that would use each other's wrap tokens and then suddenly there's like 100 billion of TVL. Um, you know, we see that with trading as well. Like if you can get a situation where the trading fees are zero or net zero, you can wash infinite back and forth. I'm not seeing any, anyone does this, but you know, uh, even like when it's transparent, like hyperliquid, you know, sometimes it'll show like 300 million volume in some, you know, coin nobody knows about. And it's not exactly like that. It's just because when you don't have transaction fees, metrics change their meaning. So like, you know, volume, traded volume has a different meaning. And TVL can have a different meaning if you keep like counting wrapped uh, tokens. So I think uh, it's a bit of education and, and you know, the providers of uh, dashboards hopefully can clean up and be like reliable sources of information. Okay, so I would like to leave every one of you uh, to, to allow you to do a round of one last thought I'd like to leave the audience with regarding our current topic. Irene. Yeah, sure. Uh, tomorrow I'm speaking on a panel about real world assets and I, I'm really excited about tokenization of, of T-bills, for example, and I think the omnichain approach is particularly accretive to that. And so, uh, my parting message is just like that's a space to watch, and I uh, I know of a, a few really really exciting in initiatives coming out that I think will bring net new users in, uh, and, and that's exciting. So so adding to this, like my question is: Is tokenizing real world assets actually bridging? Like, uh, and the native bridge is simply the real world. Like the native chain is the real world. Yeah, for sure. Meet space is a blockchain. Yeah. Okay. So. 
last 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 thought from from the uh, uh, for me uh, well so again I'm 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 odd one out here on on the stage I just represent a lowly protocol um, but um, like I want to tie into a previous answer I gave which was on the the fuck around and find out as to a way to communicate information like we'll be we protocols will be there trying to offer financial solutions for people to effectively bet and gamble on all these developments because some will fail and some will not, and that's where the opportunity lies, and that's where information will be conveyed. Jody? I'm just excited that you know there are still people looking at innovation, and we're really excited about innovation. We want not just like copy-pasting the same idea and taking the smart contract and putting a different front end. We do love builders um, and people, even not on Mantle, anywhere, that in the space are really trying to do something to push the avant-garde kind of forward. Seraphim? Yeah, what I'm really excited about is uh, Lila committing to V2 in decentralization. So there's going to be a little panel on 19th about with P2P about um, um, kind of staking. And I'm, I'm hoping that in the next one or two years, we can make everyone proud at Lido and just expand the validator sets of thousands of people so that you can never shut Ethereum down. So that's something I'm really excited about. Thank you very much. And let's give a round of applause to our great panelists today. Thank you, Shosha. Thank you. And I believe that we have still some like few minutes for questions. Are there any questions for our panelists? Um, how long do you think, uh, think um, layer zero will take to take over like the, the volume that multi-chain basically processed over the yeah, last year or something? Uh, and also do you think, well, how long do you think layer zero will, zero will take to uh, will be able to offer to bridge to all of the, the small side chains that basically multi chain um, was uh, yeah offering yeah like the the tail uh, end there uh, well I'll start by saying the multi chain hack is is truly devastating and I, I I've been in Paris for a few weeks now and I have been in, in discords just like talking one on one with so many people who are affected and it it really really is is a sad and, and colossal one. Um, Multi-chain is the sort of legacy bridge and, and incumbent. Uh, many projects are reaching out now to ask for help in unwinding assets and, and moving over to OFT. I think the most uh, recent and very successful example is the MIM token. Abracadabra team uh, luckily did all this whole migration before the hack. Uh, and since uh, moving to OFT, I think they've reached like one million transfers, so that's been great. Uh, you know, we're open to have those discussions with projects, and so I hope that these projects can find stability and and uh, you know get the support they need from all these other primitives as soon as possible. I don't have a, a, a timestamp on when I think that transition will have been made, but I also think the foundations of ecosystems that were particularly affected need to take a very active role in supporting their ecosystem. This is not the time to do like a, a tweet thread or and, and just sort of stand back. Um, and then in terms of, uh, your second question was just broadly about, was it layer zero growth? Yeah, basically, so when you see what's Oh, all the, all the all end the volume and Yeah, yeah. Um, the well, the really exciting thing is we're spending a lot of time with OP Labs and a few of these other uh, labs teams that are now launching like very rapid uh, app chain uh, deployments to figure out a, a quicker way, for example, like with shared sequencers and whatnot to, to provide uh, arbitrary message passing be between these chains. But for layer zero to launch an endpoint on an EVM compatible chain, it's negligible work at this point. For non-EVMs, it's a lot trickier. Um, so, you know, for example, there will be a non-EVM that we in intend to launch on very soon. But the, the difference in, in code, it's like 2,000 lines of solidity for an endpoint on an EVM. And for this non-EVM, it's about 50,000 lines of code in, in, in that um, programming language. And so if you think about the risk there, it's just a magnitude of, of like higher. Uh, so that means you know we're looking to do 10 external audits, do blue and red team testing internally, private testnet, then public testnet, um, and you know take our time with it. There's no reason to rush. We have to get it right. And uh, our ecosystem can't afford another exploit. Are you also... Um, are you also um, how, how do I say it uh, correctly? Like carry on the flame that multi-chain uh, actually was developing right now because as uh, 
um, like there were a few developments going on. Basically, the first one was the ZK EVM stuff, and the other thing was the ZK router stuff, which was developed by by Shu, I think, uh, or Alfred, um, as as he's known. Uh, and they were close to launching it already. And as uh, as far as I recall, everything is open sourced um, from from the router and. From how how I see it, it would be a shame like if all of those uh, developments would not carry on in some sh shape or form. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, actually, you're you're number two now. You're number one. <laughs> the great thing about open source code is that any developer can go in and yeah. pick that up. And so we'll be really excited to see teams do that. Uh, our architecture and design, and even just like ethos and core principles at Layer Zero, are so different from that of the mm. multi-chain team. So, uh, you know, we have a defined product launch roadmap for the next six months and, uh, you know, are really excited to get that out. Mm -hmm. But if teams have, like, requests for what they need to build in a more secure and efficient way cross-chain, reach out. Because okay. most of our roadmap is just informed by the inbound and the DMs that I get every day. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Do we have any other question? Yeah, there. Hey, uh, my name is Nadim. Um, I have one question regarding um, bridging, for example, as a service. I mean, it also counts for other services that come from a protocol. Um, I mean, there is the end user, but then there's also other protocols that are using this service, like s similar to a service agreement in traditional world, where I have a contract, and if my service sir, is failing to provide, I can sue, and I have this layer of protection. I think we are completely missing this um, because when we are, for example, I'm part of a team that is developing a stable coin. When we are using another protocol as a service, we are completely, yeah, we don't, we don't have any control. We, of course, we can buy governance tokens, but probably we don't have the money. So, like, I'm wondering how can we, um, yeah, how can, what, what kind of mechanism can we introduce to protect the part of the service that we are using from another protocol that provides a service? My off-the-cuff response is if you're issuing something like a stable coin, like so, so important, and it is supposed to be the lifeblood of a DeFi ecosystem, you should not be relying on services in your infrastructure stack. The, these should be like immutable primitives, and if there's a security risk involved, you should own part of that. Um, and be participating in it. Your your community, your delegates, whatever governance should also be a part of that too. And there are ways you can do that. And I, I think I had touched on it earlier and I'm happy to chat with you a little bit more after around how you should do that. But uh, no, I mean, even services just run out of runway. Like there are teams that can't raise their, their series A and so they're just gonna shut down operations. And what if that was an integral part of your infrastructure stack? You'll have failed all of your users. Yeah, I would add to that that yeah, we should rely on code like in this terms. Like, if, if, if we can't rely on code, that we are not building crypto there. It is. We should talk more after. It is. Yeah, yeah. Is there any other question? There might be, but this is going to oh. be rest over lunch time. Okay. Uh, I'm starving. Here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shishtov. Um, everyone will be resuming at 2 p.m. We've got great talks throughout the afternoon. Taylor Brent from Reserve Protocol kicking it off. Make sure you don't miss it. Enjoy the food.